Hopefully, uh, about now, everybody's come close to receiving uh, a campaign uh, brochure that talks about our chapel. And so I want to share with you just a little bit uh, about what God is doing here at Cottonwood. And so we'll put this all on your screen. Uh, you can uh, look in your brochure when you get home. That's yours uh, to keep. Uh, it's, uh, it's your program to let you know how to pray over the next couple of weeks. Uh, and let me just tell you a little bit about our chapel campaign. For those of you who might be guests with us, and what a blessing it was to have over 6,000 people with us here last weekend on Easter weekend uh, through our Saturday night and uh, multiple Sunday morning services through into the Sunday afternoon. So we know we have lots of guests with us. Let me tell you a little bit about our church. Let me start by giving you a history. Uh, some of you know the history of our church. Our church dates all the way back to 1882. Here on May the 7th, we will honor our 135th anniversary as a church. Y'all give God a hand for that. That is a fantastic thing. And uh, right here is the original building of the church back in 1882. It started off in West McKinney. How many of you live in West McKinney? Raise your hand. Everybody live in West McKinney? All right, all the way through there, some of y'all are like, it's okay to live in West McKinney, folks. All right, in 1882, about El Dorado and Hardin is where the church started back in 1882. Dennis George was our founding pastor, all right? And so be sure and tell him I said that. By the way, he's going to lead our prayer time after this service. Uh, oh, oh, he's right there. Uh, by the way, Sharon was born decades later, okay? Decades later, back in the late 90s. And uh, so Dennis founded this church back in West McKinney uh, in 1950. Now listen to this. When you, when you always wonder, do, do the people of God need to always listen to God? One of my favorite things, one of my favorite sermon series I ever preached years ago. I was one summer, I was getting ready to preach at youth camp, uh, and this year I'll be preaching at youth camp again. I, I love being with our kids, and I love just getting the opportunity to share with our kids. It, it makes me feel young and old both at the same time. But I was reading through the book of Exodus, and we were at youth camp one year, and I was reading through the book of Exodus, and all of a sudden, as much as I've read through the book of Exodus, these words jumped out at me. They leapt off the page at me. They were these simple words, and then God said, and then God said, if you've been around here, you remember that next summer I actually preached a sermon series entitled, Then God Said, because it was like it exploded off the page that God showed up to the children of Israel, and then God said, go do this, and then God said, do this, and then God said this, and there's always a season, and as you look at the history of our church, there's always been those seasons where God said something. God said something new. So in 1950, there was nobody, believe it or not, living in West McKinney. The, uh, the uh, combine had come in. It was all agrarian over there. All the people lived on the east side of 75. So if you can imagine, in 1950, the church was either going to die there or relocate. They relocated to Highway 5. You can drive down Highway 5. You'll still see this little building. It's the Column Baptist Association building right now. In, 18, in 1950, they moved from West McKinney to Fairview. Why did they go to Fairview? So they could keep reaching people. Now, how many of you think it's a little funny today to think about leaving West McKinney to go reach people in Fairview? But that's what they did because that's what God told them to do. Then a few years later, they relocated to this church uh, in Fairview. It's right over there. These, these two churches are a couple of miles apart. And, uh, and back in May, 22 years ago, this Mother's Day, I, will, I came to that church. Uh, another pastor before me, Calvin Usry, led the church to go there. Then a couple of years ago, back in 2002, 2003, we relocated. Then a couple of years after that, uh, we added to our gym, we added the worship center in 2008, which is where you're worshiping right now. Since then, we really hadn't built, built anything. Man, we've been through, a, how many of you know we had an economy crash in 2008 and 2009? We haven't built anything. We've added some things, we've increased some things, but we never built anything. And this is where we are now. Let me give you, if you're new here, here is the simple mission statement of our church. You ready? It's basically five words. Love God and love others. That's our mission statement. It comes right out of the Great Commission, 
right out of the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. Go and make disciples. That's our mission statement. Here's our operating motto. This is our motto. Are you ready? To simply minister to the next person through the doors. That's our motto as a church. Minister to the next. Now notice we all capitalize that word next. This campaign is called our next generosity stewardship campaign as we look to give to a chapel. Minister to the next person through the door. You say, where did that come from? Back in May of 1995, my son Jace, when we came to the church, uh, who we saw his last ever uh, lacrosse game, they got beaten in the playoffs yesterday uh, by that team down in Austin. And uh, they're orange, but I won't say their name. But I'm not big fans of y'all today. But he, played, he was six months when we came to the church. Gina was pregnant with our daughter Jordan, who's a junior at OU. My very first Sunday, I preached from John chapter 21. I preached where Jesus, remember after Peter had denied Jesus, not once, not twice, but three times. In John chapter 21, um, I preached this sermon where Jesus went to Peter and said, Do you love me? And he goes, Lord, you know I love you. Do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. And he said, Then feed my sheep. Jesus said, Feed my sheep and tend to my sheep. And I still have it written in my notes that day. I preached with handwritten notes back in, that was back in the dark ages, okay? What does it look like at, at that time? It was First Baptist Church of Fairview. And I remember, remember being in that A-frame church, and I said, we're going to minister to the next person through that door. And for 22 years, that's kind of been our motto. The next person through the door sometimes is young, sometimes they're old. Sometimes they're single. Sometimes they're married. Sometimes they've got it all together. Sometimes they crawl through the door in bits and pieces. And the beautiful thing about this church is we've always ministered to the next person through the door. Since those days, 20 year, 22 years ago, we've started divorce care, grief share. We've started Celebrate Recovery. We've started you know, hundreds of Bible studies, women's Bible studies, men's Bible studies all about ministering to the next person through the door. That's our operating motto. And guess what? Those doors, those doors, those doors, we're ministering to the next person through the door, and some of y'all are here. Our location, here on 121, God has sovereignly placed us um, in, right in the heart of Collin County, right here on Sam Rayburn Tollway. When we relocated, God blessed us. Since we relocated, even before we had this worship center, we relocated and started off in the gym. How many of you are with the church when our motto at the end of every 11 o'clock service was, stack them seven high? How many of you remember that? All right. Uh, that's why people love to go to our Saturday night service at the time and the 930 service because they knew the 11 o'clock service had to stack the chairs so we could use the gym the next day. And so... Um, we, uh, God has placed us here, and then, but even before we built this worship center, and even since this worship center, there have been five facility statements that I have heard more than any other, that our leadership team has had heard more than any other. Number one, we have no place for a wedding. We have no, right after we built this worship center, right after we had a couple of weddings in here. But it became pretty obvious early on that 200, 250 people, that's a really good size wedding. It just gets swallowed up in here. This is not a great place for a wedding. I did a few right up front. Now, I essentially marry our kids, boys and girls, as they grow up all over Collin County. I've married them in every restaurant, every barn, every uh, uh, other chapel. I've married our kids anywhere and everywhere. Also, no place for a funeral. We've actually had more funerals in here, memorial services in here than any other place. We don't like them. But mostly that's when either someone of high profile passes away or a child or something where really the community comes in. But this is not a great place for a funeral. The most mem uh, normal memorial service, about 100 to 150 people. So it's not a great place for funerals or memorial service. No place for a small worship environment. On Sunday nights, not tonight because we'll be having Tim Hawkins in here, we usually have a 615 service that I preach right in here and it's a much smaller crowd. 
Whatever those uh, a number of people, we all kind of sit right in here in this section. This isn't a great place for a small uh, worship service. On Wednesday nights, we have a probably the fastest growing service in our church right now is our midweek service. And it's made up primarily of young adults and young college students that are coming because of their weekend schedule and their work schedule and it's beginning to blow up. You say, where do they have that midweek service? Right out in the atrium. Right out there where there's some, there's some I'll be doing Q&As over the next couple of weeks. There's some chairs set up out there. Our facilities team sets it up, puts our tech team and our video screens up. They have worship on Wednesday night. Then on Thursday morning, they tear it all back down. Why? because we use that atrium for anything and everything. Uh, no place for small worship environments. Uh, no place for prayer service. Dennis and Sharon, they lead the Tuesday night prayer time. Every card that you drop in there gets prayed over by a group of our people in our Tuesday night prayer service. If you ever need to be prayed over, that group is there to pray over you and pray with you. They are faithful every week, and Dennis leads that. And in doing so, they just go into a Sunday school room over there. No place. We'd love to have them in a prayer chapel. Uh, here's another one. No covered walkways or drop-offs during inclement weather. Let me ask you a question. How many of you on a rainy day have ever noticed that there's no way to get in our church without getting soaked? Guys, how many men here would love to have a space for your wife to drop you off <laughs> so you can get into uh, how many of you guys? How many of you? I noticed a bunch of single men raised their hand. That may be the reason. Uh, but anyway, those are the five most common complaints that I've heard people about. How many of you would agree with these five things? So we all would. Everybody knows. How are we going to address it? Let's go to the next slide. I forgot what it was. All right, now I know. Why build a chapel in the covered walkways and not something else? Uh, Let's be honest, we could build a children's building, and we love children around here. We love children, and that would minister to children. We could, we could build a youth facility, and we love our youth here, and that would reach our youth. Uh, we could build education because we need more education space, and that would help us, particularly in adult education. But when we talk about building a chapel, I think there are two massive reasons. First of all, it absolutely meets those five most commonly held complaints in our church addresses them all in one fell swoop with the chapel and covered walkway. But the second reason is two words, mission and ministry. A church should always be on mission to love God and love others. How does this address mission? First of all, by reaching young adults through weddings, young adult services, youth worship services, etc. Our youth are excited. Our youth staff is excited. Every time our youth does a worship service, they go into the gym. They would love to have a Thursday night youth night of worship or a Saturday night youth night of worship in a chapel area. So mission. Let me let you hear from Bo, who is our young, one of our young adult ministers here at the church. Hey, my name is Bo Landers. I'm one of the discipleship pastors here on staff at Cottonwood. And and I just want to take a second and talk about how excited I am that the chapel's being built. As uh, one of my responsibilities up here is over our young families, uh, young married ministry. And so part of that is our premarital part. And um, as we look at, at developing and strengthening new families, one of the ways that we've done that is start our premarital class called Before We Say I Do. At first, we, we thought we might get just a few couples signed up, but uh, just this first time around, we had 11 couples signed up ready to uh, go through our entire premarital course uh, to start their marriage off right. Um, and so as we look at building a chapel then, to be able to take that, to have them married in the chapel under a sacred space, to talk through uh, different biblical principles, uh, to, to set them and start them off right in their families. Then to, to basically transport and, and, and move from there into a time to where we can plug them into life groups, we can plug them into the life of our church here, uh, is just an incredible opportunity that we have. And, and to have the chapel as, an, a, a, in, as a part of that process is really exciting. And so for our young family ministry, we're looking at it and looking at this chapel as a great opportunity to start marriages off right. And, and hopefully then to fuel uh, the young family ministry here at Cottonwood Creek. Amen. That's exciting. And as you hear about that, so if you want to think about a chapel, most people don't think of a chapel being mission, but it's mission. 
You remember when uh, Bo said he had 11 people sign up? Let me just share something beautiful. Of the 11 couples that signed up for our very first ever, before we said new class, of the 11 that signed up, only one is connected with Cottonwood Creek. And so there is an opportunity. There is an opportunity for the gospel and for mission through the chapel. But it's also ministry. That's the second idea. Uh, weddings, midweek services, Sunday night service, funerals, Tuesday night prayer service, education space. Somebody uh, will uh, meet in, uh, in that chapel on Sunday morning, education space. I've made this offer to all of our life group teachers and directors. If, um, if, if some life group will just raise $2.5 million, I know where you're having Sunday school on Sunday morning. All right? I just know where it is. But uh, so it'll be education space on Sunday morning. It'll be uh, uh, Sunday morning kid care, worship, fresh spirit. Uh, that's a women's ministry, concerts, recitals, music, expanded VBS, topical seminars, as well as covered walkways. We get the opportunity through a chapel to build uh, a chapel where our kids can be married in. That's ministry. Our grandkids, we can leave a legacy. Say, grow up here, get married here, uh, right in here. But also, we also know that there are seasons uh, uh, where people are grieving, and they're looking for a place to have a memorial service. We'd love to open up not only our weddings, but also memorial services to anyone in our community that needed a space and a place and covered walkways, and covered walkways. I'll tell you a little bit more about those in a few minutes, but first, let's hear from Dennis and Sharon George on the chapel. Hi, everybody. I'm Dennis. And I'm Sharon. We're Dennis and Sharon, and we've been here at the church for uh, about 14 years now. With great joy, we get to talk to you today about a, a thing that's happening in our church we're really excited about. I've been a pastor of three churches. I've been an evangelist. I've done a lot of different things, and I've been here for almost 14 years, I guess. And uh, now we get the chance to be in a church that's going to have a chapel. And if you don't know what I do around here, I do pastoral care, which means I do a lot of weddings, I do a lot of funerals. Uh, we're gonna have the opportunity to have our own complex here, our own facility, which means we get these families that will come in for weddings and they'll come in for funerals and all kinds of relatives, moms, dads, aunts, uncles, kids, and everybody. And we get to reach out to all of them uh, right here in our own facility, plus all kinds of other things that uh, we'll get to do. I also do our, our uh, Tuesday night uh, prayer uh, meeting and so we're going to have our prayer meeting in there and invite you all to come to that as well. We're just really excited about it. So uh, thanks for letting us be part of it. Okay, that's mission and that's ministry. Now let's talk about the chapel, all right? Now let's talk about the chapel. Let me tell you what's been done. This is what's already taken place, all right? Uh, we've uh, uh, had the smart people come in and look at our facilities and say, hey, here are your greatest needs. Uh, then they said, really what you need to do, the next thing you need to do is you need to build a chapel and you need to build covered walkways. If you'll remember, we came at the end of 2016 and communicated that to you, gave some pictures to you uh, as well. Uh, we took at the end of last year what was called, just after promoting it, a seed offering, what we call a seed offering. Uh, people were faithful to give in 2016. Uh, those a couple hundred thousand dollars that were given, that's been used for soft cost, what they call architectural engineering fees, fees that you would normally have associated. So we've been able to use those to pay for what you refer to as soft costs going along. We've hired an architect, we've hired a contractor, and when I say we, I want you to hear a team of people, all right? Uh, I didn't sit down and interview Pogue. I didn't sit down and in th interview the three builders. I, I didn't sit down. Teams of people did all of these things. There's, you, have a, you have a stewardship team, and I've told you trustees and personnel teams. So when we say we, I'm talking about we, the lay leadership teams. Uh, set a floor plan and walkway position, set a budget. This is what we can spend, $2.5 million. Affirmed by the stewardship team, trustees, unanimous business meeting approval. So now let me tell you a little, that's what's been done. Let me show you some pictures and tell you a little bit about the chapel. Show the first picture if we can. All right, where's the chapel going to go? Right out front. How many of you... Uh, come in from the back of the worship center. You park out back, you walk in the back. All right. How many of you come in from the front? All right. Uh, right out front, 
really since Palm Sunday, it's amazing to me, there are many people in the first service that come in the back. Since Palm Sunday, we've had uh, sticks and orange rope out front and a big sign that says, here's where the chapel's going to be. If you picture yourself going out that atrium, we're going to knock that wall down and you would walk right in to the chapel, okay? So here's where the chapel would go, right out front on the north towards 121. Here's what it would initially look like. Now, please do me a favor. When you look through your campaign booklet and you look through everything and you say, well, I don't like this about the chapel. I don't like this. Or I wish the colors were different. I want you to know the only thing that has taken place in this chapel is we got an architectural design to talk about here's what size it needs to be, here's kind of where it needs to be placed. We've got contractors in there making sure we hit budget, all right? Then one of the next things we will need to do is put together a color and selection and design team. So if you look at something on here and you say, why did they do that? That's just the architect's rendering. The most important point at this point is for us to get a budget set, a contractor to say, I can build it for that budget. Here's where it's going to go, and we begin to take the design steps. So please don't get hung up and say, I don't like the drapes, okay? I guarantee you that hasn't even been discussed. We know we need technology in the room, but we want the ability to hide the technology, right? So the architect said, well, let's put drapes up, all right? Don't get hung up on drapes, please. You've got a whole group of lay people that will come together and talk about whether we're going to have drapes or not drapes, but we're not going to have drapes. Uh, now you know where I stood on the drapes. Uh, all right, so go to the next one. Go to the next one. This is the entrance. Notice that's the center aisle. So like I said, if you walk out and if you leave that door, how many of you know there are chairs that go up to our baptistry area? The stairs, that's those stairs that you see right there you would walk right into the chapel, the back of the chapel. So you'd walk out, walk right into the back of the chapel. What do we think the inside of the chapel is going to look like? Go ahead and go to the next one. Something like this, all right, very similar to this, except for I'm not sure who's getting married, and I don't know who's doing the wedding, but other, and I don't know who any of these people are, by the way. Um, but this is essentially going to be what the inside of the chapel look like. You say, how big is it? 320 seats. Why did you th choose tw 320 seats? We called the 10 most highly rated chapels around us uh, that are used for weddings and memorial services, and the average size of those chapels were 225. So we said, well, let's be bigger than that so we can handle 99% of all the weddings and any memorial services and anything. So it's about 320 seats in there. Um, you see the stone. You'll notice from the first rendition to the second rendition, you will notice because this is actually the second rendition. If you remember the first one, how many of you remember looking at the first ones that there was a center window from top to bottom? How many of you remember seeing those? How many of you could care less because you don't remember seeing those? All right. That's a great architectural feature, but there's a problem. That's one of our main entrances out there. So people, instead of listening to someone preach or watching the wedding, they'd be watching cars drive by. So he said, we probably want to probably close that off. We love that. So he took, the, he took the cross that was going to be outside that window in the garden, and he put it on the wall. So we're in the process of design. Does that make sense? We're about to put together a team of people that will make all of the color selections, the stone, the colors, the beams, and all of those kind of things. We just wanted to right now make sure we had the right footprint and we can do it at the right price. Go ahead and go to the next one. This is from that side of the building. You will notice you've got a chapel here, and we have a covered drop-off that will extend right out in front. How many of you would love to have a covered drop-off during inclement weather? There's going to be one up front. Uh, I tell you what, go, to, is, go, go back to the previous picture. Before that, I forgot to point something out. Before that. Okay, there's also a covered walkway going out here. I should have pointed that. That means that going off on the east side of the chapel through the main entrance, there's a covered drop-off. Going off to the west, if you park out in the north and the west facility, there will be a covered drop-off that goes all the way back to that drop-off. All right, now, 
One of the things is I started talking to our leadership teams all the way through. I said, listen, I've been the pastor here 22 years. I want this to be the most transparent building process anyone's ever been a part of. So I'm going to tell you everything about it. You ready? I'm going to start with a couple of twos. There are two goals. There are two goals. Let's go to the goal. We have two goals. The two goals are everybody participate at some, some level. Everybody take part in building a legacy for our kids and our grandkids to reach college kids and adults. Everybody participates so when God begins to use this chapel, you can say you took part in it. Uh, last year, God kind of brought to us and gave us uh, the sand volleyball courts out there. And if you haven't been watching what's been taking place, drive up on any, by, any night. There are kids out there, kids we have no idea who they are, calling college kids. We're about to have loads more coming home from college. I'll tell you what's going to happen someday because you participated. Some young boy and girl are going to meet each other out here on the uh, volleyball court. They're going to decide, hey, let's go on a date to Easter Sunday service. They're going to get saved. They're going to go get married right out in that chapel, and we're going to see God bless. I'm dead. So is, that, is that not funny? Do we not want that to happen? All right. Okay, good. So we kind of get kind of our own cottonwood harmony. Sorry. What's goal number one? Everybody participate. Goal number two, we want to raise the full $2.5 million. We want to raise the $2.5 million. That's our budget. Our stewardship team wants to pay cash for this. They want the congregation to embrace it. You say, Pastor, can we do $2.5 million? Absolutely. 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 You say, Pastor, is $2.5 million easy? Absolutely not. If you've been at, in other, other campaigns uh, for churches, even our church, usually what you do is you give, your, you give the congregation three goals, right? You've, you've seen us do this. When we relocated, when we built the worship center, three goals. You give yourself a low goal that you know you can reach. How many of you know what I'm talking about? This is one of, so the church gets a win, right? And the pastor doesn't get fired, all right? The second goal is a stretch goal, and the third goal is a hallelujah goal. That's the way we, you know, that's what people would recommend. As your pastor, I, don't want this, I wanted this to be the most transparent thing. We're going without a net. $2.5 million. Let's do it. You say, can we do it? Yes. What will it take? It'll take all of us. It will take all of us sacrificing, all of us giving, and trust in God. Do I think we can do it? Absolutely. What if we don't? Our stewardship team will come back in here and we'll figure out what plan B is, but right now there is no plan B. There is no plan B, okay? So I just want, I told you, just totally up front. How many of you are okay with me being that transparent with you? All right, hopefully so. You know where we are. 100% participation, $2.5 million, two parts. Okay, two parts, a one-time gift and a one-year commitment to give. Traditionally, in a building campaign, you go three years or you go 24 months or you go whatever, and um, man, your stewardship team has to figure out, well, okay, we'll get X percentage of first-year commitment, X percentage of second-year commitment, and we'll get a little bit of the third-year commitment. So we said, listen, we're going to have a one-time gift. And we're going to have a 12-month commitment to give. That's how we're going to do it. Just 12 months. That way our stewardship team knows exactly what they're working with. They know exactly what they're working with. So two goals, 100% participation, $2.5 million. Two parts, one-time gift, one-year commitment to give. All right, let's go to the commitment card. Everybody pull this card out of your creek guide right there. All right, you will notice... Hopefully you will notice. If you don't notice this, uh, someone's playing a joke on you. Yours is not filled out. How many of you know that? We didn't assign everybody by lottery, just numbers, okay? You notice that commitment card has three parts as you look. One is your one-time gift, all right? I'm going to tell you when these dates are next. A one-time gift. We're going to pray and ask everybody in the congregation to pray about what can I give up front? What can I give up front? A number. 
All right? And then come on Commitment Sunday, um, on Big Give Sunday, and give that number. You say, where does that come from? That's what comes out of our savings accounts, our stocks, our bonds, our real estate, our mutual funds, et cetera, et cetera. All right? That's where that, that comes from what you refer to as stored assets. You've been wise with your money. God's been, bless you. You've been successful. Come with a one-time gift. Secondly, your systematic gift. What can I give over the next 12 months? What can I give over the next 12 months? The third part is a faith gift. All right? Now, here's what's going to happen. Everybody's card in your prayer is going to be different. Why? Because some of you, because of where you are in your station in life, you have a lot of stored assets, but maybe you're retired or whatever and you don't have a... So your first number might be large, the second number might be smaller. Some of you, because where you are in your station in life, your, your first number is going to be small, but your commitment to give is going to be bigger. Now, if this is your number, this is where you look over on the chart. You say, if I'm going to give... $12,500, here's what I give every month or every week. If I'm going to give $25,000, here's what I give every month and every week. If I'm going to give $75,000, here's what I give every month or every week. And that's your systematic commitment to give. Then there's a third area called a faith gift. There are certain people, because of your business or your uh, line of business, that you have big commission checks or you have deals that land or something like that. And you just, between you and God, you're going to pray, God, if this happens, we're going to give above that, above that, we're going to give this. You add those three numbers and that's your total commitment. Now, let me, let me, just, let me just talk to you real quick about this chart. Um, we have not pre-assigned anybody numbers. That's between you and God. You and God and your family, y'all sit together and you talk about it. Here's what I know. Probably, if you're like me, y'all, y'all know I, I, I'm kind of a math guy, I'm a business background. When I look at that and I know my, my family, I kind of can come to a number. My eyes are drawn to a number. Isn't that the way we're built, guys, uh, ladies? We're drawn to a number. Here's what, you want. Here's what we're going to be praying is, how can God get us, God, would you lead us to get to that next number, to go up one? Now, the second thing, so, so you're drawn to a number, pray in faith that God would take you to the next number. Here's the second thing. I know there's already a bunch of people out there that have done the math. You've already said, if there are a thousand families in our church, divide that by $2.5 million, and if everybody will give $2,500, we're there. How many of you have already done that? All right. That's great in theory, but that doesn't work. And here's why it doesn't work in the church. Don't forget, of those thousand active families, many of those are widows, who $2,500 to them is monstrous, are single moms who $2,500 would be monstrous. And there are other people in our church that are blessed that they could write $2,500 a hundred times over and not miss it. Does that make sense? So it's not about dividing. I, I love what the Apostle Paul told the Corinthian believers. He says, he says, each one gave according to what they have. Everyone in here has this, has this, has this, in a total. So it's all about us coming together. All right. There are going to be some people who come in and they'll sign up for a thousand bucks. And that is a sacrificial gift over the next 12 months. There'll be some people that come in with a thousand uh, dollar commitment and they're nowhere near where God wanted them to give. So let me give you some dates going forward. May 7th. May 7th is Commitment Sunday. May 7th is the day that we're asking you to pray for and bring this card back to church. Remember, you, sign, you, you pray through with your family those three numbers and total it there. You will turn that card in. Then you perforate, tear that perforation off. And uh, then you get the opportunity to pray through and keep that. So that's Commitment Sunday. The next day, by the way, that's the day we celebrate our 135th anniversary as a church. Uh, May 14th, that's Mother's Day. It's Big Give Sunday. It's Mother's Day. That's when you bring your offering. That's when you give your upfront offering on May uh, the 14th. That's your upfront offering. 
May 21st is Celebration Sunday. Whatever God does through us, we're going to celebrate. Whatever God does through us, we're going to celebrate. Our stewardship team will be up here. We'll talk about, you add this number to this number and to this number, and this is what our total number is. Does that make sense? So that's Celebration Sunday. That's what's coming up. Now what? Uh, two things we can do together. Go ahead and go ahead. Now what? Yeah, two things we can do together. Notice we're keeping it at twos because I couldn't remember a bunch of threes today. Enjoy what God is doing at Cottonwood Creek. I just, want to, I just want to tell you, and I'm, I'm in, in meetings with, with pastors and groups, um, God, what God is doing at Cottonwood is amazing. It has been for a long time. So enjoy what God is doing at Cottonwood. Enjoy the fact that we have the opportunity and a need to build a chapel. Number two, everybody commit to hearing what God wants to do through you for the chapel. Everybody commit to hearing what God wants to do through you. And I will promise you, it will be a different number for every person in this room.